Here, the tentative budget appropriations public hearing uh, at 6.55 p.m. on Wednesday, June 21st. Dan, would you please take the roll? Uh, Karen? Here. Carolyn? Here. Dennis? Here. Diane? Here. Patty? Here. Linda? Here. Chen? Here. All right, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Maybe uh, the purpose of uh, this hearing is to allow the taxpayers of Niles to um, of the Niles Public Library District, soon to be known the Niles Main Public Library District, to comment on the tentative budget and appropriations ordinance before it is made final. Um, I think we have some public comments, uh, or some individuals who would like to make public comments on this subject. And I see we have um, uh, Mr. Uh, Joe McCoola has signed in. Uh, Mr. McCoola, am I saying your name right? Yeah. Okay, would you like to um, uh, make a few comments? Yeah, we're and, speaking, uh, You know, we try and get you on the tape, so... You're, you're fine where you are. Where I am. Oh, uh, I, I wrote it out, so I'll, I'll get everything I want to say. Okay. It's come to my attention, I was here at the last meeting, that you were talking about the... Uh, well, first point I want to bring up. From what I understand, you don't need a library card to participate in anything at the library here. Am I correct? Um, I, 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 I think that there are limits as to who can sign up for certain programs, and certain uh, residents have, that is, cardholders have priority in signing up for certain programs. I but you don't restrict non-residents? Well, that depends. But, but why don't you go ahead and right, make, make your comments, because okay. I don't want to cut into your time. All right. Uh, it seems to me, it, it, you know, we're the taxpayers. We're, we're covering for the people that don't live in the district. And um, as an example, you're, you're doing this comic book thing, which I'm sure you're not going to ask for uh, uh, people that are out of the district to, to show them, uh, you know, membership in, in Niles or Niles Main District. And I have no idea what this is going to cost, but my, my guess is with Sven Bully here and uh, all the setup, it's going to take like 200, 300 hours and man hours to do this. When you figure the, the salaries and everything, you're looking at spending maybe ten, twelve thousand dollars on this. And last meeting I was here, they said they expect to get five or six hundred people. That's twenty dollars a person for this thing. I mean, this is this is like a like a sideshow. They have the same thing in in Rosemont. Why are we doing spending taxpayers' money to duplicate something? It, it, it just doesn't make sense. And taxes are going to be going up, I think I saw 7% uh, this year because of reassessment. So, I don't know, I think give the taxpayers a break. You know what I mean? I, I, some of this stuff is unnecessary. It, it's Are we running a, a, a sideshow, a circus, or something of that nature? Or are we running a library? So. Also, I, I recall last meeting that they said that the labor expense was 70%, when normally in the library it's 50%. Now, probably a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're running these types of extracurricular activities and, and spending a ton of money on them. You have a ton of money is in people organizing all these things and, and uh, marketing them and everything else. Uh, you have 64 full-time employees, from I can figure out. I think at, at least you should put a hiring freeze on. I don't think you need any more people, and I think you should cut back on some of this type of stuff and, and just through attrition let your number of workers go, because that's your biggest expense is labor and government. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Um, I, I invite you to stay through the rest of the meeting because I think we may be addressing some of the issues that, that you've uh, mentioned tonight during your comments. So I invite you to stay for the whole here. evening. Okay. Um, I don't have any other uh, comments or any other individuals listed um, on the sheet of those who would like to make public comments during our uh, budget hearing. Um, therefore, hearing no further comments, the 
uh, budget hearing is adjourned. And we'll move on to our regular uh, business. So, um, of the Niles Public Library District, or Trustees to Order. It is uh, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, June 21st. Diane, would you please take the roll for this meeting? Karen? Here. Carolyn? Here. Dennis? Here. Diane? Here. Patty? Here. Linda? Here. Tim? Here. So the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, where we have our number of uh, relatively routine matters on our agenda. I, I do want to point out that one of the things that were um, that is included in the consent agenda is the setting of the schedule of the meeting of the Board of Trustees for the coming year. So I want to know, does anyone want to take that out of the consent agenda? Does anyone want to discuss the schedule that's coming up? Uh, okay, fine. So we will take that out of the uh, consent agenda. So aside from item, anyone else? Anyone else want to take anything else? Okay. Aside from item 2D, we're now looking at items 2A, B, C, and E. Do I hear a motion to approve those items on the consent agenda, which includes the minutes, the regular board meeting of May 17, 2017, the payment of bills for operating expenses of $339,318.64, payroll expenses of $260,605.38, and special reserve expenses of $2,589.51 for a total monthly expense of $602,513.53. And to approve payment to a visiograph in the amount of $5,891.36 for the publication of the Summer Chapter 1 newsletter, um, to um, adopt Ordinance 17-04 for the prevailing wage rate for laborers, workers, and mechanics employed by the Niles Public Library District. Do I have such a motion? I have a question. So, <clears throat> is this where we could uh, raise a question or ask a question about certain bills within there, or where are we supposed to do that? Um, I think we usually do that during the Treasurer's Report. Um, That's fine. Okay. Okay. Sir, second. I just have one quick question um, that I'd like to ask, uh, and that is, I noticed that we have on our table here what are indicated as revised minutes. Um, and uh, Diane, can you tell us how are these minutes revised from the ones that we saw in our packet? Uh, in case uh, individuals haven't had a chance to look at the revised ones, how are they revised? Where well, Trustee Olson uh, emailed me and uh, pointed out that the uh, the times for the executive session were off. Okay. So I made the change. All right. It's so it's our time to 8.56 and the end time at 9.49. Okay. So aside from the times, were there any changes no, on the revised? Exactly. Okay. Anyone else have any questions about that? All right, Diane, would you take the roll then? Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, let's turn to uh, consent agenda item D, which is um, regarding setting our schedule. Um, do we have some, does someone like to make a motion that we can, yes. I'll make the motion. Motion to adapt? To whatever, just so we can talk about it. Whatever okay. it has to be made, I'll make it. All right. To uh, set the schedule of meetings yes. for the fiscal year commencing January 1st. Um, all right. Um, do I have a second? I right, second. All right. Some comments regarding our schedule? Uh, the only comment I had is the December 20th meeting. Uh, that's a little close to Christmas. Um, I don't know about everybody else. Uh, I probably won't even be in town that time. I was wondering if anybody else wanted to move it up a week. We've done that in some other years. Um, so yeah. I think we would. I think that's a very reasonable request. So that uh, moving it up to December 13th, is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Does anyone else have any thoughts about that? I think that's a good idea. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, 
So we can move it and second, uh, accept an amendment to their motion to uh, adapt the schedule yes, so as would. to change the December date to December 13th, but yes, otherwise keep the schedule the same? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you, would you accept that amendment? I too? do accept it. Okay, all right. Um, any other comments? Just one question. Can yep. we get the date of the December meeting now? What would it be? December 13th. Thank you. Also Wednesday? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Dan, would you please take the roll call? Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Diane? Yes. Ray? Yes. Linda? Yes. Jen? Yes. All right. Um, do we have any public comments in this regular section of the meeting here? Yeah. Okay, there are no comments for uh, the regular public comment section of our meeting. Um, at this point, I, I know that we have uh, a guest here with a presentation, so um, I'm going to ask if there's a motion to take one matter out of order, and that is to take the item which is under new business, 8D uh, regarding the purchase of the exterior sign package. I was wondering if I could have a motion to move that up so as to address that now. I make the motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so, um, I believe we do have a guest here tonight. Hey. Um, sir, would you introduce yourself to the crowd, please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex Krug. I work for Product Architects. Um, here to talk to you through the sign committee that you guys should have in front of you. Um, Do we have a copy of it? Yeah, I, I think it's in our packet. Okay, so I'll have to check that out there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry. Here, one. Carolyn? Yeah, it's yeah. for sure. Thank you very much. Does everybody have one? Yeah, it's in our packet. Oh, this is the PowerPoint? Oh, this is. This looks like an invoice. Oh, uh, that's the same. That's, that's, that's the bid. That's the bid. Do we have a copy of your PowerPoint? Uh, it's on flash drive. I do not have a hard copy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think I'll just walk, um, if you have the bids in front of me, I'm just going to walk you through pretty um, much every item. So number one on that first page, uh, sign type one. Uh, here's the, oh yeah, okay. Um, sign type one is uh, a sign in the corner here of Waukegan and uh, Oakton. It's a ground sign, uh, you can see it over here. That's to catch people coming down Waukee and turning out to open the court. Uh, the quote for the signage quote, which includes installation, uh, is for seven thousand four three three. Uh, we have a little bit of a landscape allowance in there right now. Okay, yeah. uh, it looks like there's a lot of good information on here. Uh, it sure, would be nice if we could somehow uh, get, get a copy of the, the presentation. Absolutely, at some point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It'd be nice. Um, and then actually at the back of your packet, uh, the very last page, we got an electrical quote from uh, a block we used before. I think you guys may have worked with them before as well. Um, to do uh, electrical, so that would include like uh, four floodlights on the ground to light illuminate both sides um, as you drive by. So the um, sign itself is what? The sign itself is not self-illuminated. Okay. Uh, it would be illuminated from floodlights at the ground level. Okay. So where would those lights be? Uh, they would be like there would be two here, two here, and then two on the opposite side because the sign is actually double-sided, so that you can read it from both ways from driving down Waukee. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So is the total cost for this sign nineteen thousand dollars? Yes. Yeah. Including the sign itself, including installation, is seven thousand seven seven five hundred. We have an allowance for about 2,500 of landscape which you have in your, uh, your village. And I'm sorry, and the electrical yeah. quote yeah. is included in the there. The electrical quote is, an, is a real is a real number. Okay. Uh, Thank hard you. number. Thank you. 
the electrical uh, corp, Carolyn, will be uh, will be bid competitively because they they received one quote for that. Okay. So we will get uh, two other uh, uh, vendors to uh, uh, submit an estimate as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving to the second page. Bid. Sign type two. Uh, there's actually a quantity of two of these. There's one at the driveway uh, pulling off of Oakton, and then on the opposite side off of Oakton Court. Um, so the, to the total for both those signs is about 8,500, and then we have a landscape allowance for both signs of about 2,000 to bring two signs to 10. So that's for the bushes? Yeah. You have to have land, you have to have ground cover to is part of the municipal code. For any sort of type of ground sign, anything that touches the ground like that, you uh -huh. have ground cover. Mm -hmm. Good no. uh, So, I'm, I'm trying to follow the line in your quote here. Mm -hmm. that's, so, so that's line item number two, which is on the I have number page. two, mm -hmm. but you're saying there's two signs. There is, there's an identical sign across the parking lot coming off of Oakton Court. All right, but where, where does it say that in your quote? Uh, oh, see. You see where it says okay. unit? Oh, I see it. Okay. Price is four thousand and then it next yeah. to it. Yeah. But the total for item two is shows eighty four eighty nine. It's actually ten four so, yeah, eighty nine. Including a okay, so that landscape. there'd be a difference yes. Yes. Correct. that's without the on this shape. Okay. So the the purpose of the of the bid was to uh, to get a quote on the signs and stock. Um, in addition, we have to bring electricity to one location, mm -hmm. and as I said, we'll bid that out. Uh, in terms of the landscaping, uh, we'll work with our uh, current provider to, um, uh, I'll say, heal the ground around the uh, around the sign so that it looks like it looks like it was never disturbed. And whether it's you know two thousand dollars or or not, we'll get a separate bid on that and all the work. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving to the third line item, 3A. This actually includes three different signs. So it includes a sign along the front of the building, this one here. It includes these address numbers, mm -hmm. and it also includes a, a, a sign along the side. And the reason why there's a 3A, we'll get to 3B next. 3A, the difference between 3A and 3B is purely material. So these signs are like a stainless steel, um, you know, clear. And then the 3B is a paint is a different product because it's going on the uh, existing building of the road. So I tried to break these out. Um, they're all grouped together, but I tried to break based on the we had a, we had an original quote from ASI um, before we went out to bid, and sort of using his original numbers, I sort of broke them out. So the address number is about four hundred dollars. This front sign here is $38,000 because it includes, there's some work that we have to do to that, uh, you'll notice your, your uh, steel fence is now covered in uh, metal to, to mimic the, the parapet below. We're basically building up the parapet there. Um, that's all due to the municipal code. You're not allowed to have um, a sign above the roof line of a building. So that's our way to mediate that. Also, it looks pretty good. And then this third sign along the side, about $1,000. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing yeah. on number three a, a total of a 26. 20, yeah, 20, oh, it's a, that's a GF5, 25057. Okay. And that includes okay. three signs. So it's, it's these two, this sign, this sign, and then along the side I'm looking to court. Now, back to your slide though, then you, you've got 30. 38. Right, because it includes uh, construction. Right now, so we, we don't currently have a quote for that. We're actually in contact with companies right now. Again, it includes in the work associated with the construction of this new parapet wall. We're estimating about $25,000, but we're working to get uh, hard numbers on that. We, we contacted a few, uh, one person I think who worked in the building before who wasn't able to quote it, had too much work this summer. So wouldn't the total be like 50000 then? Uh, if the quote is for 25 and the construction is 25? The, 
Mm, no. So the, the quote, line number number three, includes three signs. So th this quote is just for the signs. Uh -huh. okay. um, so it includes this sign and the installation of that sign on the uh -huh. new parapet. It includes these address numbers and the installation on your current canopy. And it includes this sign installed on your, on your brick facade here. So the, the total the total for those three signs is the twenty five zero five seven, but there's an additional twenty five thousand dollars if you're gonna do this sign because we have to build up the parapet edge. So, so, I'll, so, I'll, so I'll, yeah. let, let me just yeah, yeah. offer some words. Um, so uh, what Alex is doing is marrying the construction quote to one portion of the signs, which is worth uh, thirteen thousand three hundred. Oh, I understand. Okay, so if you take the thirteen gotcha. three plus the four hundred sure. plus. The, the 11 200. Yeah. 11 200. That's 20. Then you get the point of view. So these are just all, all the signage stuff. That's so signage signage purely signage, signage without them. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 3B again, the only difference, this is also a building sign, the only difference is that we decided not to go with a um, stainless steel here because it was there was just a lot of materials going on. So we went with kind of mimic. That, uh, that roof edge uh, with like a, a painted bronze finish. And that sign is 4,000. Okay, this one, your current existing ground sign at the corner. Um, Greg asked me to try and break it out. Uh, there's sort of two things we're trying to do here. We're trying to update the copy on top, the existing copy, to represent your name change, as well as looking into trading these LED boards out for new video LED boards. So it's a three-sided sign. This will be you know, three, three updates of the copy, three LED signs. The update, uh, again, these were sort of grouped together on this line item. If you go to line item number four, which is sign type four. Um, on the next page, mm -hmm. line item number five, sorry. Line item number five, sign type oh, four. So you see a 56717. Mm -hmm. We're estimating the LED, the three LED signs is about fifty thousand dollars, and then the, to update the copy is about seven. And that's again based on the original quote that we got from ASI back in uh, January. Um, yeah. Next page, line six. For uh, parking lot banners, you see here, uh, you guys have eight, currently have 18 uh, light poles. So this would be to have the, the banners on both sides of the 18 poles. Uh, pretty straightforward, 1565. And then lastly, um, we also have some banners um, attached to the side of the front here, these uh, six banners. And that would be 5B. So that's line number seven. Where are the six banners? These, these right. blue banners. Yeah. So you can, Between yeah. the windows. Yeah, vinyl printed banners that you can change up for different programs and whatnot. So I guess that brings us, I guess to tell you what's going on right now, we've submitted to the village for the building permit for this new facade up here. Um, we're basically, they have approved it. We're basically just waiting on if you guys accept the sign, um, and then also getting the quotes, and obviously finding a contractor, we gotta let them know who that's gonna be. But short of that, they've approved that portion of it. The signage package as a whole has also been more or less approved. Uh, you guys can do pretty much everything you see here, except for one thing, which is this LED sign, which will require us to go for a special variance. Um, I'm not sure if you guys had to go for a special variance with, on your current one back when. Um, that you do now for to swap out the new ones. We don't see much of it. We knew this was going to happen. Uh, we don't see much of an issue with it. Uh, you guys already have one. So we're just trying to update it and make it look nice. Um, only thing that has to happen for that, again, if you guys accept this, uh, we just have a letter into the city to get that process going. It takes you, it takes about two months to get through the special variance process. I have one. Yeah. Um, you mentioned regarding this sign mm -hmm. that we will be it's, uh, three, four, is it? Um, five. Okay. Five. It's an, a new video LED sign to replace the LED sign. So the terminology and the difference is the word video? 
Uh, is there a difference between what we have? And well, what your current one, I think, is only what is like the kind of old school gold and just amber. sort of message yet yeah, amber. This one will be able to do like you know full color, um, just sort of update the look of the sign. So it'll have more color, and then I think one of the reasons for wanting to look into re having this particular sign changed is the cost. For is it bulbs or filaments? I don't know what the terminology is, but will the upkeep of this sign be identical to the upkeep mm -hmm. of the last sign? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, as far as I know, I know that oh, that sort of technology has gotten a lot uh, better. There's no bulbs. It's a it's like a screen, like a TV. Um, is there a way that you could provide us with what the ongoing maintenance is? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, is there a warranty? Uh, yeah, there would absolutely be a warranty on it. Um, it's sort of it's like that, it's fixed, there's like different panels on it, and they're swapped out, it's a lot different than the whole technology. Right, so are the panels replaced after time, like do they wear out? I mean, I know right now Sasha is buying something, but in the future he'll have to buy something for this as well? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, the LED lifespan is, is, is pretty long, I mean, I'm sure everything dies eventually, but I can give you guys more information on that. Thank you, yeah. thank you, that would be great. I just have a question on the, um, the six banners. Yes, the six banners in front. Right. So here. those are vinyl mm -hmm. um, panels. And then do we put like things inside to swap? Uh, and it'll change probably it, or? be like two rods, and then you, it's it's almost the exact same thing as like you see on a parking lot, where there's two rods coming off the light pole, and you slip it on there and lock it. You know, oh, okay. Sort of so we would just swap have it to out. Buy something else and then put it in. So yeah. you're giving us the Frame, the, the frames um, that we put in the, the information? That is a good question. Definitely the hardware is included, okay. um, and I would think at least one printing of the sign itself. So, it, like, for like these generic sort of signs of just advertising the library, but you guys would have the opportunity in the future if, say, for summer reading, or if you wanted to make some sort of custom sign yourselves, it would be easy to swap out. So uh, yeah, I would say the quote includes the hardware, like installing it, the hardware, as well as whatever your generic sign we decide when we go through shops and that sort of stuff. So what would be the cost of replacing the changing of the signs? Uh, like what materials is it even? Is it like a cloth? Like you it's know like a have... it's like a rubbery sort of like Maybe you see it like on. The, like vinyl? Yeah, it's vinyl. So would we be purchasing that from you, or would we have to go out and have some um, sizes? You could definitely work with ASI. I mean, it's something that they do every day, but I'm sure there's a ton of vendors out there that you guys can go and get quotes for this type of stuff. Okay, so if not, you, I don't know what your printing capable is, or in-house, or close by, other um, it's a pretty typical product, I would say. So I guess I just have one question too then. Are they, are we, um, looking at that for signs that are going to be there for, you know, the same type or things that are going to swap out? The idea is to swap them out. The, the model for it is like the banners you see on Lakeshore Drive as you're going to the Field Museum. That was what Sasha's original ah, idea so was. So that like it, when you have something special, for example, uh, the pizza exhibit that we had, if we had had these banners then we would have been having slices of pizza on the front of the library. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you know how much they... Well, Sasha has printed, printed banners in the past. I don't, it's not oh. extraordinarily expensive. Mm -hmm. We've printed similar size to the, the pole banners, not the ones that are on the building. Um, and they were, I can't say fairly inexpensive, but they were probably like a couple hundred bucks a sign. So it's okay, so like vinyl. it is vinyl. Oh, it is absolutely okay. vinyl, and um, it you know it's obviously made for weatherproof okay. and, and such. Um, don't quote me on the couple hundred. I don't have my just numbers in front of me, but yeah. You know, um, uh, for the parade, we were carrying those eight foot fine banners. Yeah, I think they're a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. And not only that though, she, we can get um, uh, paste and replacement pieces that you don't have to really. Uh, create brand new banner. I don't know if this will take it or not, but then those are all options as well. Uh, I do have a question now. Do we? Uh, how do we replace those banners? Are they going to need a person to go up on a big long ladder to do that? Is that a, seems like it's a lot. No, I mean if we're swapping them out for different No, if we're swapping later, yeah, we would probably have higher, I'm assuming. 
I, I would think Dave could do the ones on the building, but not the ones on the wall. Right. So yeah. Again, those would go right after six well, yeah. <laughs> But those are more intended to be more permanent. They're they're not uh, oh, oh, right. the whole it's just like the, the initials of the library and the library's logo oh, are not going to be changing. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, it's more so the ones by the windows that you're talking about with place. Correct. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Any more questions or any more requests for information? Right, did I hear, um, do you want to copy the PowerPoint? Yeah, that'd, yeah. that'd be great because if you really have a lot of information yeah. right on. Well, and then would the next slide. Would they do figures at the bottom? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You do this exact copy. Okay. And then I'll also get you more information on, I'll try and get some more information from ASI about just general vinyl, what to expect for well, breaking those banners, as well as uh, warranty or upkeeping information for the uh, corner. Thank you. Okay. Um, we don't take public. Outside of our, uh, our session. Um, so, um, well, I, I'm hearing a request for some further information. Uh, yes. Do I have a, a motion to table this? Then? I would like to have a motion that we table it until we receive additional information, and then we can take a little more time to thoroughly go over all of this and the upkeep or what we might need to do further. It doesn't sound like this is a complete package yet. I second it. Oh, okay. Sorry, too much dialogue. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so before we, we break, uh, uh, yes, I, I think actually there is a, I don't know if we could really debate a motion to table. I think it's either sort of yes or no. Okay. Um, but is there any other information that we need from, uh, I or so. I'm asking members that, uh, Board here. Is there any other information that you need or want? Uh, I presume we can also pick certain parts of this package and not others. Absolutely. And the quotes remain the same. If we choose to do one sign and not another, we can yeah. uh, sort of We can sort of pick part of it apart and there might be some items where we have to sort of go out for an uh, official reverse change order or something like that. But the bid is broken up by sign type at least. So we can start to dig into it. Do, do we need to know about how long each portion will take? In order to um, install, create, or install. I mean, are we talking? You know, I don't know. Uh, I need you guys to schedule two weeks or uh, uh, six months. A rough schedule as well. I hear he's at twelve times. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I just, I just a general comment. I, 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 maybe for your other clients, you might want to consider a larger fund. And, and we're trying to look at the PowerPoint and look I'll at the PowerPoint. I'll definitely test it on It's really hard. Right. It's just so, PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. We never did vote on the motion to the table. Uh, we took a vote on the motion to the table. Right. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. yes. Dennis? Yes. Diane? Yes. Danny? Yes. Linda? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah, there were. Um, if, if you look at the motion sheet, there were uh, there were ten uh, firms that expressed an interest. Oh, okay. Um, there was only uh, one firm that submitted a bid. Oh, wow. Huh. Um, Alex, do you have any feedback on, on why the other nine firms uh, chose not to? We had two drop out literally 24 hours before, um, and one just said he didn't have enough time to to get a really responsible bid and what just said he was too busy. Uh, we were in contact with all ten throughout. I mean, okay. A few of them seemed like they probably just didn't have were too far away or didn't have interest. Some one of them, a couple of them were actually out of state I believe. So okay. but we were surprised at the last minute sort of we we were hoping kind of for three. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, is there any possibility that they'll they will eventually bid? Um, no, the bidding is closed. You have to, I guess, go back without the public bid again. Mm -hmm. Which gets good questions. Probably. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, then we're going to go to the uh, next item on our regular agenda, which is the Treasurer's Report. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it out my report so everybody can have a copy of the one.
it's a I want to point out that uh, our normal uh, oh, thank you. our normal report that we produced uh, these past several years starts on page nine. And I had asked Greg to see if we could uh, create a, a different one that included the uh, budget account um, that, that are associated with each expenditure. In the past, we've had some trustees who have asked for that information uh, so that they could, uh, I don't know why, but I guess keep track of um, expenditures in, in budget line items. So that uh, report is on page 14, starting on page 14. It's a little longer. Uh, I'm sorry, it starts on page 13. I think. All right, there we go. Starts on page 13. <laughs> So it's a little longer. Uh, what I ask is that uh, we all take a look at this one, and you know, if we want to continue with it or not, maybe uh, let me know next meeting uh, so that we can uh, decide on that. Um, but you will see it's, it's basically the same as the other one uh, on their um, the payments uh, goes to, uh, coincides with the total check amount or, or the amounts. And then it, it relates to the uh, account description. So the I, way I'm sure. confused. I was, I was going to sure. say the way I'm reading it, you've got a couple extra columns on page nine versus on page thirteen. Is yes. It, well, you know, we don't need transaction type since it's always the same. We don't need source. That's always the same. Uh -huh. Status is basically always the same. So I kind of thought we didn't really need. It. You know, I as a computer guy. I never like to print columns of information that never changes. There's no points with it. Yeah, and as I say, less is more. Sure. So I had asked him to get rid of those uh, couple of columns. Can I just ask sure. one question about the status column? Um, is it always outstanding? Would it never change? Uh, what are we looking at? The first, well, the first report is still going to be always in the foundation. Is that something that will never change? It's always an outstanding payment? Well, um, so this is a check register, if you look at the top. And the status has to do with the check, whether it's outstanding or clear. Since we haven't mailed the checks yet, all of these checks are always going to be outstanding when you see them. But after a month hence, several of them will have cleared. I don't reissue this report regularly. So, you will always see outstanding. Okay, so then there's no need for it. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not asking that we replace the report. I'm saying that we can have one, we can have the other, we can have both. Um, kind of what I'm asking is to take a look at it uh, the next, throughout the next month. Okay, so you don't want our opinion now? Uh, yeah, absolutely, if you want. I personally think this one looks a little bit easier to read. Which one? The what? page 13. 13? Uh, uh, Tim, I want to point out that sure. um, I created this report using the report writer in the software. Uh -huh. um, I, it does not include the credits that have been issued from these uh -huh. companies, which are included in, in the payments, sure. and they've sure. been applied against invoices. Um, I've been looking for a way to get the credits on there, okay. um, but it's you know it's it's just something that's not offered in that part of the report writer. Sure. Hmm. So can you explain what you mean by that? What credits are we not seeing on the report that starts on page thirteen? Um, what would we not see here? I don't know if we have any credits on. Yeah, yeah, I think um, every once in a while we'll on have page a nine. On page nine, yeah, that report. Yeah, hold on, let me uh, just. Okay, so for example, if you look on uh, page nine, Alliance Entertainment, um, and you won't you won't see uh, the credit. You see an amount of uh, 1968.87. That's on page nine. It's right near the top, about the fifth line. Yes. If you look at page 13, uh, you see a number of invoices, uh, which. Uh, Look like they add up to 1968-87, but they don't. If you add them up, they add up to 1975 and something cents because it was a six dollar and twenty-five cent credit. 
Uh, what's in the previous month? Uh, uh, well, you know, we always, with all of the vendors, we're always ordering new things or, or, or returning things sure. for credit mm -hmm. sure. or maybe the pricing was off or something like that. And um, I can't get that credit to appear on here so that if you handed it up, it would add up to the 1968 Okay, But if you look at the copy of the check, you can see the credit on it at the stuff. So I, you know, I'm happy to produce reports, you know, but the credit, uh, but the uh, report writer has limitations. Um, and anytime I, re you know, I produce a report, there's always a danger of anybody producing a report that that, uh, that we somehow lose data integrity. You know, in this case, the credit's still up there. You know, so uh, if you added everything up, you know, all of the uh, individual charges, you'd be about two or three thousand dollars higher. To what the actual check register says. Okay, all right. Um, does anyone want to make any comments about which version they like, or if they want both of them, or huh. do they have any thoughts about? I, I think I think Greg is saying that you, at this time you need the bank register. Yeah, I insist so that, that, that yeah, the yeah, right. because, because it's, it's the, the full it's yeah, yeah, it's the, the full picture. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you want. You know, if you want the uh, secondary uh, report that starts on page 13 uh, because it gives you some additional insight, I'm happy to, you know, to produce it and have it included. Does uh, it take very long to do? Uh, no, it's it's set up. It's it's a matter of changing the dates and, and running the report. Uh, setting it up is the hard part. Okay. Anyone have any comments? I mean, what is an A5 field to I like it. I like the detail. Yeah. All right. It helps help me understand it better. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, All right. And I, I certainly never would have thought that thing about the budget, so I wasn't going to be. You're not going to add everything? I didn't add everything up. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we, we may want to talk at some point, completely outside of my report, but maybe doing a double sided printing of pages here to put them in the paper with them. That's, that's, all, that's all I have. All right, uh, on to my regular report. So May is uh, the 11th month of our fiscal year, and it is uh, 91 67th of the year. So we're looking at uh, spending amounts of about 92% to, um, to see if we're on, on schedule for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, page 33 of our uh, income statement. Just in, 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 in my reports, you know, we just kind of highlight things that are uh, uh, this is something about. You know, obviously, you can ask any questions you want. But our per capita grant uh, on page 33, line item three, uh, we've got nothing. So we are waiting for um, the paid amount to come from the state. Generally, we receive the money in May, so it's now June, and we have yet to receive it. Uh, when, in fact, we do receive it, if we are in the next fiscal year, that amount will be shown on our income statement for that fiscal year, but in a sense, it will be money that we got for the previous fiscal year. Is this what they were voting on? No, it's um, the state awards a fixed amount per person in each district. Oh. So, um, yeah. I remember you were looking for us to kind of... Oh, yeah, yeah, that, those were the LSTA grants, and those were federal grants. Yes, okay. this is the state's grant. Okay. And they, they did get the letter saying that we're getting it again this year. Okay. They changed the amount of the water. So we're waiting on that. On page 34, the next page, uh, for capital expenses higher uh, due to our, uh, our payment of $12,000. Or Communico, if you guys remember, Communico was the organization, uh, the software that we're going to use for um, scheduling rooms, right? Uh, we, we all like the Communico, so it was, it was pretty fun. So we got a little higher expenditure on that. Uh, and I have to say that the condition of the per capita grant is that every penny must be spent by the end of the year, or we do not get the funds the following year. So. so I, it actually will have to go over a little tiny bit just to be sure that we have spent every single penny. Oh, okay. So we have to spend every penny even though we haven't received it yet from the state? No, this is, this is last year's grant. It's next year's that we're oh. waiting on. 
Oh, okay. Okay. All right, uh, but the entire uh, uh, category, the uh, library operating expenses, were at 88 percent, which is under our 92, which is great. Uh, page 35, uh, general and administrative expenses are a little higher due to a promotional line item. Uh, promotional expenses, that's about right in the middle. Uh, we have spent uh, money in preparation for the 4th of July parade and to communicate our name change to the community. Um, however, the entire line item is under budget for the year, and the total general and admin category is running at 82%, which is you know, pretty 10% below our budget, which we're doing great on that. Okay. Page 36. Employee fringe benefits, $8,000 under budget due to lower than expected reimbursement requests in the health and dental line items. Cool. So our teeth are doing well. <laughs> Good. All right, that's uh, all I've got on the income uh, statement. Uh, any things that I needed to point out specific? Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can entertain those. Any questions? Is this where I would ask questions? You may ask. You may ask a little. So I, um, again, I, I'm not quite sure how this would work with our can okay. So like uh, on page 9, it says air advocate charitable foundations. I can explain that. And I did, did know that that would probably catch people's eyes because it's an unusual expense. What it is is that we are uh, working together with several other libraries and with Advocate Lutheran to supply books to children in the hospital. Uh, for, uh, to get a book to every child, and so um, we contributed our share of that. So it was three hundred dollars to contribute. I think it was ninety copies of a particular book that every child will be getting. But that was where the check had to be made out. Okay. And then uh, to the fifth third bank. So um, page uh, ten. What we what we have uh, payroll. Uh, we have a certain uh, number of people who make contributions to the flexible spending account. Oh, okay. So those uh, flexible spending account deductions are bundled, and then their check is cut and deposited into the flexible, flexible spending account, uh, bank account, uh, and help for reimbursement. Uh, and then uh, libraries first. Libraries first to handle some of the contracts that um, we get a price break through them. So they handle, like, I think this one was for the tutoring service that we have, the online tutoring service called Green. Can you use? Yes. And then uh, just this one other one, uh, Niles Elementary School. That's a monthly expense for the parking spaces that we rent at Culver School for the library staff. This is the way of trying to deal with the constantly overcrowded parking lot. Thanks, it just helped me. Uh, oh, there. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. so, you know, after a while, after while you, you know, it's, it's funny about this. After a while, you look at these and you start recognizing the yeah. same payments. Yeah, no, I, I figured as much. It, yeah. it just, you know, when I saw the charitable foundation, sure. I don't know if it was a donation. I'm sure, sure. You know, I wanted to sure. make sure we were, I'm sure we would work if it was there. So, sure. Um, I have a question um, for Greg. Um, I'm looking at the income statement, the consolidated. Um, Page, are you on the I'm on 37, and I'm actually looking at um, how we ended the year. So um, our annual budget is six million four hundred thousand. But I have a question: since this is the income statement ending May thirty first, there are still expenses, correct, that we have accrued in the month of June that will be applied towards the twenty sixteen seventeen budget, correct? Hey, Carolyn, yeah, this is not the end of the year income statement. So, so my question right was: uh, is do you have that information or do I need to ask Greg? I was wondering how much do we have accumulated so we know how far over our budget we will be. 
Do you have those figures? Does no one have those figures? Uh, those, those, figures? those figures won't be available until the next close. Right. So and there's, there's, the, still, there's still 10 days left in the month. Right, exactly. So we don't know where we are as of June 21st in terms of the additional expenses we need to pay out of what will soon be last year's budget. Yeah, I'm not sure what your point is, but no month, I, can't, is, I can't predict the actual the in the no, middle I don't of the month. You to but, predict. No. Okay. We don't have a running tab, like we don't have records that we don't have some sort of software that indicates how much we still have to pay out of next year's budget. This, just to make sure I understand this figure correctly, everything that we received as of May 31st is included in this total. Yes. So any invoices that have come through since June 1st are not included. Correct. Normally, companies know how much has been accrued and needs to be paid. We don't know that. Uh, well, Carolyn, I'll tell you what. Um, uh, let's uh, research that. And I was well, I mean, that, you know what? I, I like the term research, but can't you come into these meetings and acting like I'm asking a question from Mars? Well, There's Carolyn, no reason we, why we at the end these... of our... Excuse me, Greg. Number... Uh, I'm Tim. Excuse me, Tim. Number one, I'm really asking Greg Kritz He's the business manager. Well, I understand, but I'm the financial well, uh, the officer here. You're a treasurer. So we're going to try to. Uh, I know. I get it. You're a treasurer and you read the report. I'm looking for his expertise because he is aware of how much we do spend in the library and what we need to be concerned well, Carolyn, about. Carolyn, everybody knows that you don't have an update uh, by minute by minute, day by day accounting of okay. all the no, expenditures. Okay, no, excuse right? me, but in finance, yes, you know exactly where you are because your year end is very critical. I'm not asking them to pull a number out of a hat. Right. And, and I have a difficult time. Well, Carolyn, have we ever presented that information? I asked these questions before this board was here and it was not impossible to I, just, I have a question so if but can i finish Go ahead. and and greg i i appreciate you being the treasurer but you're not the finance person i'm the, tim that's greg well, i'm tim okay tim anyway Very back good. to my point i yes. I, do, I understand you're the treasurer and you read a report i'm asking for his expertise all right but we're not going to hijack the meeting on this issue Okay. I'm not hijacking any meeting. Right. But then I have a question for you, Tim. I noticed at the last meeting you mentioned that um, you were unable to receive the figures you needed in a timely fashion, so you didn't have some sort of report. Was it you didn't have time to type the report? Is that what you meant? Yes. You needed to get figures from Greg and No, from I didn't have enough time. I didn't, uh, my personal time, I did not type it up the way I gave it to you this time. Oh, because you mentioned you needed to get figures from Greg and Susan. I didn't understand what that meant. I'd have to go back to the meeting, Carolyn. I don't, I don't have an eidetic memory to remember exactly what no, it said. No, but at the I last think, meeting, I think we needed figures, figures from them. From them. Yes, I did not have to wait for them for any figures. Okay. Do you have a question? Well, I just, was, I just had a question. Um, so are you, I mean, if I was guessing, you're assuming that we're going over budget? I'm looking at our annual so budget, budget, which is six million four year to date we're at five nine. So I wanted to know what our expenses are as of after May 31st. We've got a whole month yet. Oh, right, but I wouldn't want to make an assumption until it's over. I mean, oh, no, we're so I'm not making an assumption. Under, but we're so it's, 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 so, to people who don't work in accounting and finance, it's really not an incredibly that's difficult pretty, question. But it's still very close and it's still within our budget, in, in my eyes. So, mm. but okay, thank you. Mm. Or in any event, we couldn't possibly know what we might spend in exactly the, exactly what we'll spend in the next ten days anyway, will we? I mean, we'll only know at the end of the year. You'll right. have that information. The budget for is, you know, okay. it's an estimate. Exactly. No, budgets are not estimates. Budgets are estimates. It's a blueprint. It is it's not. What estimate. part of a budget is estimated? You just any guess. part that you don't know exactly what you're going to have right. to spend exactly. It's always an estimate. Anytime you make a budget, it's an estimate. A budget is based on facts. All right. Objective okay. budget is based on opinions. All right, okay. let's move on. So I'm not quite done with my uh, report. So the last meeting, Trustee Driblick asked for a breakdown of the components of the current fiscal year consultants line item and the new fiscal year's budgeted consultants line item. And subsequently, she asked for the line item invoices and consultant proposals for the new budget year. I supplied all the requested information, Trustee Driblick and all the other board meeting members. 
and also explain to Trustee Driblet through our emails that uh, our budgeted line item for consultants was not based on actual proposals, it's based on uh, expert in, um, um, opinions as to what we will possibly be studying in the future. I did have one question, thank you for that information. Sure, um, as I was going through the copies, I noticed we paid um, $150 for, was it the passport, the person that, the consultant for passports, was there a fee involved in that? Yes, she's a consultant. I thought she worked at another library. She does work at another library. For that library, she does not work for this library. So She works for the Skokie Library. Correct. And we had to pay her $150 to speak to you about the possibility well, of the she passport came, agency. She came and met with us and offered her expert opinion. And it's, she's charging $100 an hour, which was a very, it's actually kind of a low fee, but because she is a librarian, she gave us kind of a break. And yeah. Well, I wasn't aware that we needed to pay for information from another library. Well, it's not another library, it's an individual who's working for Well, us. she was described as some lady at the Skokie Library. That's when we were having all these discussions. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just taken back that we actually had to pay her, and, and that didn't come up when we were discussing the um, idea of a passport agency. When I said she would be a consultant, I did. I, I always think of the consultants as being paid. Well, you said she consultant. was an expert. She is an expert. And and, but, but Skokie Library does not have a passport service. This was at her previous job. And you know they're not going to pay her to come talk to us about work she did at her previous job. I guess what I'm trying to say is if it's going to cost us money to learn about something that we're trying to accomplish or we need to do, do you think you could bring that to our attention? I, mean, I would have never thought you had to I pay someone. I believe that it's within my purview as library director to hire people as you know, if it was going to be a great deal of money, I certainly would bring it to your attention. But $150 is not a lot of money. But what I'm trying to say is if I didn't get a copy of it, I would never know in the line item for consultants what actually it included. So if I didn't see all those details, I wouldn't have known how much was technology. I mean, there's quite a bit there. So I'm trying to figure out how can I be aware of what we're spending without having to always FOIA or ask for exceptional things which are extra work for you. I mean, can't we just, couldn't that have been part of the dialogue? We do get a check register every month that tells us exactly what we're spending. Well, it does, well, actually this check register now gives us a breakdown, but I mean, um, it's hard for me to figure out who that lady was. All I'm saying is, I don't know why it didn't come up in conversation. Okay, all right. Um, I guess it speaks to my, my concern about transparency. Okay, well, Carolyn, I, I, you know, it's possible that uh, many things cannot be said due to time considerations. So, you know, there, Susan and Greg do have to have some leeway in order to make a, a judgment call as to what they bring up. Probably a bill for $150 is a little under the radar as to what they need to specifically bring up, in my opinion. And I understand. Okay, okay. I think we've discussed uh, that pretty thoroughly. So I'd like to move on to the director's report. Uh, Susan, do you have a report for us? I do. Um, in addition to my written material that I have provided here, and I hope everybody got a chance to read, um, I wanted to just mention so that you will not think that I have forgotten all about it. I am continuing to work on the strategic working plan uh, together with the team that has been working on that. I believe I will have it ready for you for the July meeting. That would be, again, the 12 to 18 months breakdown of the tasks needed to accomplish the first year, you know, the first mm -hmm. bit of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, likewise, passports. I just, I didn't want you to think we've forgotten all about passports. We're a little bit stuck in a holding pattern right now where we're trying to get the State Department to answer phone calls and respond to things. The State Department, you know, is not famous for answering people rapidly, so um, we are still in process. We still are working on it, but until we actually get the information that we need to get our staff trained, there's not a lot we can do. So we're, we're continuing to work away, and I will continue to update you on that. Um, we had originally hoped that we would get that up and running by July 1. I do not think that's realistic now. But, you know, hopefully later this summer, and that we'll still be able to start out the service uh, in a slower period and get a little bit of an idea of the flow of it. And again, that would be actually a revenue-producing thing to do, that we will actually get money from that. 
Um, I wanted to make sure that all of the trustees were aware that it is summer, so it is the summer reading game. And um, I just wanted to show you the collateral that the marketing department has produced for it, which is incredibly cute. This is the, um, the log for the small children, mm -hmm. as Patty probably yeah. knows. Yeah, we have one of those. Extremely cute, and they, they mark off their favorite books that they've read during a particular week. They come and visit, and they do little activities that are developmentally appropriate for the different ages of kids, and then there are reading tips on the inside of it, and a little coloring sheet on the back. And then this is for the older kids where they um, we have one of those too. We have one of those too. Excellent. Yeah. So our, our theme this year was reading by design. So it's a lot of architecture, engineering, arts related stuff. And so I'm going to pass those around. Can I quick tell you pertaining to the summer reading sure. since you've got that topic right now? The kinetic sand is yeah. like, oh my God, such a hit. Yeah. She was playing with it and two other kids are like, Pushing her aside so they could get it, but That's it's great. a real big hit. I I'm think it's it. it a good choice. Great. And then, last but not least, I'm going to pass around three copies of the adult uh, summer reading game this year, which is a bingo card. And you can get uh, a bingo in any direction, and you'll be entered in a drawing for prizes with this one. And it's things like you know, read a romance, read a nonfiction book, read a book set in the past, present, or future. And so it's um, it's cute. I'm passing out three. I would like not to get any of them back again. Like, trustees so to participate. Can we participate? In Absolutely. You, know, well, you, would, you would not get in the drawing. Or when, if, we, if we drew your name, we would go, oh, no. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> which is, yeah. All right. But yes, do you stand? What's fun? Oh, fun. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to mention that the work of the Arts and Culture Council is progressing. We actually, Steve, last week managed to get a website up and running where all of the community agencies that do something with art can put a tag on their posts that are related to arts or culture and then it feeds automatically to, um, to this site, which is very cool. I'm very excited about it. I'll show it to you next month. So but it's a uh, great start. Oh, so the library can use that? Yeah, so uh, anything, for example, if we put a post up on Facebook and it's okay. arts or culturally related, we can just put on the hashtag and it will Because that's a cost that the village isn't uh, you know, paying. Is it? What? Yes. The website? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also are, the consultants that are working on the plan have come back with close to the final version of the plan that they plan to be um, uh, getting to the village, I believe we said in July. Is so, there a meeting time for that? So that uh, I will find out, yeah, because I, I don't know, I, they were not absolutely 100% which meeting they were going to be presenting at. All right. So, so they you attended one of their, one of the arts? The yeah. 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 I say I saw pictures of yeah. you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Was it the what, what was the past question? one? No, I just asked, you know, who attended yeah. it and if yeah. you had any comments yeah. on that or anything. Yeah, the mayor had wanted the board of their local agencies to also be involved. All right. And let's see, I have two dates for you to remember. Um, Sasha is putting together a special event on July 1st that he's sort of thinking of as New Year's Day since it is the new fiscal year and also the new, uh, the new library name. Um, he, uh, that I had consulted you guys about whether you'd be able to come and uh, if so, what time you would prefer to come. Nobody weighed in on the time, so we're going to do it early. We're going to do it at the, at the opening of business, so it'll be Saturday, July 1st, 8.45 a.m. Sounds good. And we will be uh, inviting all of you, the mayor, the village manager, the township supervisors. I don't know that any of them will come. We'll be inviting the media. So we'd love to have you come. And just say a few real short words, and it's <laughs> largely a photo op. And then Sasha has said um, the first 100 pa patrons will receive a free customized NMDL. So that's now that's mm -hmm. library. So I, there's I, that I would, I would love to come, but then the other time. So, mm -hmm. so it's very time. understandable then. 8:45 a.m. 8:45 a.m. July 1st. And last but not least, uh, of course, the July 4th parade. We have already ordered T-shirts for that, but uh, if anybody changes their mind at the last minute and is able to come along, uh, we would love My to have you. My thing is, like they said. I can't walk. Yeah, we, we, uh, we're going to try to get the seats back in the van. So we can, uh, <laughs> if, I can, so, if I can ride, I can go. Yeah. 
Um, so are, are people meeting in the parking lot of Notre Dame again? Yes. At yeah, what time? 8.30? Yeah, 8.30. Okay. That's a fine service. Yeah. 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 It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a time. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, no problem. Anything regarding legislative or rails? Um, well, we did successfully get our uh, our uh, federal officials to sign the letters that they needed to sign to advocate for library funding. Whether we'll get that or not, I don't know. But that was to get the funding for our delivery service between the libraries, which is a very important part of how we share our collections. Um, and no, I'm not going to anything for rails at this time. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask you to, um, I meant to do this during your uh, report, uh, but I'm going to ask you just to comment on the um, uh, comic book uh, event that is going to be here. Can you tell us uh, roughly how much time it's going to take to do stay out and what it's going to involve? Uh, yes, well, it's a one-day event, so um, I think they are um, making sure that we have the um, the logistics of it worked out properly. Um, I believe Mr. McCullough's estimate of how much it was going to cost was very, very much more than it is going to cost, um, I think. Um, in terms of staff time. In terms of, yeah, this, I mean, for example, the, one of the two chairs of the committee is um, sitting over here, it's Victoria, and she has done um, Beatles Fest management, so she's extremely experienced with it. She can do it, she can tackle it in a very methodical way. You know, during the program itself, yes, we will have a lot of staff working at that time. Um, and we de definitely do anticipate having other people, people here from other places. Our thinking of it is that, you know, people have to pay quite a lot of money to go to the special events in Rosemont. This is a way to bring a mini version of it to our community. And, um, of course, you know, libraries do share programs with each other. So our people from our library go to other libraries for programs as well. So it's all a reciprocal kind of thing, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't, yeah, I think it will, we, we are getting pretty good at running events, so it does not take a huge amount of safe time, but it will take some, there's no question, there's a lot of work that we'll do. Okay, all right, um, all right, let's move on to um, uh, new business then, I think we've completed our regular new business, um, all right, we have item A under new business. Um, do I have a motion to adapt Ordinance 17-05, which is an ordinance providing for budget and appropriations of the Niles Public Library District for County Illinois, well, which will be known as the Niles Main District, effective July 1st, 2017, for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2017, and ending June 30th, 2018? Uh, do I have a motion? Is there a second? I have a second. Okay. All right, fine. Um, now, now, before we go any further on this, is there any other additional information that uh, you, Susan, or Greg have to provide to us regarding the uh, proposed budget and appropriations? Yes, um, I had asked Greg to make your presentation, a short presentation, um, that got a little bit. Carolyn had raised the question of the percentage of our budget being spent on staff. And so Greg did some research into that, and he is going to talk about that. He also is going to talk a little bit about the whole issue of the minimum wage. Oh, okay. So you can say there. Okay. It has to be we had allocated for that. Oh, okay, good, great. Talk about that. Okay, so uh, it's just a, a brief presentation. It's about four or five slides, and. Um, To start with the uh, uh, Illinois Library Association, uh, in particular the uh, Serving Our Public 3.0 standards for Illinois public libraries, I believe everybody has a, a copy of, uh, of this. Uh, on page 12, it gives uh, some guidance with respect to salaries. Uh, these are quotes from uh, page 12. Salaries alone account for up to 60% of the total operation budget. And salaries plus fringe benefits, such as FICA, pension, uh, such as IMRF, and health insurance account for up to uh, 70% in, uh, in total. So the, uh, uh, the quotes the, are from, um, from the book, which was published in 2014. So it raises a question over the last, you know, since it's three years old, uh, are the standards still applicable? And, you know, they're definitely applicable if all expense categories change at exactly the same rate, because it's proportional. 
So if salaries go up a percentage and so does your parking lot lease go up a percentage and so does every, everything else by the same percentage, of course it's, it's very relevant. But, you know, we have, you know, some things, some anomalies, you know, so salaries at uh, Niles Public Library dist uh, District tend to change at a rate of 3%. Over the last few years, uh, the board has uh, granted a 3% uh, salary program uh, each year. Uh, also, health and healthcare insurance inflation has been running about two times CPI uh, here at the library. Uh, plus, the, the uh, 2014 numbers don't take into consideration the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. In particular, the employer mandate which requires the library to, uh, all employers above a certain size, to offer uh, health insurance benefits to employees who uh, work on average 30 hours or more per week. Okay. And you know, just a little bit of information, CPI over the last three years, uh, and this is published by the state of Illinois, uh, is 0.8%, 0.6%, and 2.1% for 15, 16, and uh, and 17, and those are uh, those are partial year numbers, um, or I should say they're not they're not based on a calendar year uh, because of the way that the state issues uh, issues the numbers in preparation for the uh, uh, for the uh, annual uh, levying of taxes. Uh, so, you know, salaries should would most likely be greater than 60 percent of the total operation budget under these conditions, and salaries plus benefits, therefore should be greater than 70% of the total operation budget. Yes? So, so I got a question. You said there are quotes that, about the numbers of 60% or so. Uh, so my question is, so they're, they're saying that on the average, they're at 60%. No, it's saying that the standard for what a library should <coughs> be spending on it is this. These are the standards for public libraries. And, and so where, where do they get the standard? I mean, because I mean, you could run a library differently in many different ways. Oh, uh, certainly. Because I mean, you, you, could run, you could run it without without any community programs, and you you would easily run less than sixty percent. There was also there are also standards in the book having to do with kind of services that are offered and, and things of that yeah. nature as well. So. You know, if you're following all of the standards, you're, you're going to continue to offer programs mm -hmm. uh, and things of that nature. So it's based off of the, the, the AL, ALA taking a look at it, what typically happens out in, well, in America. The Illinois Library Association did uh, did their research and they came up with the 60 and the 70 percent numbers. Okay. okay. There's also a 12 percent number in there which deals with how much a library should, uh, how much a good library should. Uh, Spent as a baseline on their materials that we do. Okay. And that's yeah, and, 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 I, and I ask a question just from a learning aspect. I have I, second, you know, second meeting in here, so I'm, I'm, I'm still going to be learning along the way, just trying to understand, you know, how the numbers are coming about. I'm not trying to, to uh, throw darts at anything, but I, I, I think it makes sense to, to, to really understand. Yeah. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. Okay. So, next slide. <coughs> We also looked at um, what other libraries are spending. We um, we looked at uh, budgets and uh, uh, appropriation and budget ordinances online for uh, ten comparable libraries in the uh, Chicago area. Of course, excluding uh, the Chicago Public Library, which is you know an anomaly uh, in that one, that one of us. What we found is that the range of salaries plus benefits as a percentage of total operation budget. Uh, range from 65 to 76 percent, and you know some of those, um, you know some of the numbers in there uh, were a little bit, um, I don't want to say questionable, but they weren't quite comparable to us. You know, there was one library who spent uh, about 18 million, I'm sorry, 1.8 million, almost 1.9 million on materials. We spent about 762,000 or, or thereabouts. And they weren't that much bigger than us. So as you can imagine, you know, you know spending um, a million nine on, on materials fattens the denominator yeah. and makes everything else look kind of small. Yeah. You know, so there, you know, there were some, you know, some uh, things like that. And we tried to make them as comparable as possible. 
And then the range of salaries alone uh, was 52% uh, to 59%. So where are we? Um, salaries at the library have been uh, between 56 and 62% over the last eight years. The current budget budgets for 56% on, on the low end. Um, part that I want to mention here is, is that that 56% includes $25,000 that we put in anticipating uh, minimum wage changes, which, if removed, would uh, lower the percentage by 0.4%. Um, and you know, the update on, on the minimum wage uh, issue is that the village uh, decided not to uh, adopt, or I don't know what the appropriate word is. I think they decided is. to opt out. To opt out, okay. Um, so we're not bound by that, and, and that's something that we could uh, remove uh, should the board decide that they want to do that uh, from, the, uh, from the budget this year. Also, um, so then, Greg, I, I, this is where I have a question. Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Um, I was under the assumption that it was a law, but that everybody, but then I, that the village was able to opt out of it? So uh, the county passed an ordinance, and the ordinance says that uh, on July 1st, the minimum wage in, in uh, Cook County is $10 an hour, and then it increases $1 an hour to uh, its terminal value of $13 an hour in uh, 2020. Um, uh, home rule communities, uh, which of which uh, Niles is one, can decide to opt out and not follow that ordinance. So that's what, that's what Niles did. There's a number of communities uh, surrounding Chicago that have decided not to uh, adopt the ordinance or opt out. So then since we are part of a <coughs> community, we can opt out also, is what I'm well, asking. We're not obligated. Right. We could opt out if we wanted to. Yeah, well, uh, so let's be careful. The, the library district is not a home rural community. That's that status that's only granted in these localities. Uh -huh. You know, cities and villages. So and, that doesn't affect us. And since we are in uh, Niles and under Niles' jurisdiction uh, for this matter, and Niles decided to opt out, then, then as part of Niles, we did not. I mean, we're, we don't have to follow the county. So we're, there's no action required on us as as much as you know our. Uh, our location is a, is within the uh, Niles Corporate limits. Okay. okay. So that's a discussion you all have to have. Right. And, and even though the other parts are unincorporated, so that's why we go over the Niles jurisdiction and not like one view or Northfield or no, the, uh, Des Plaines? Uh, the, re the balance of the district has nothing to do with this in this case. Oh, okay. it's, where, um, it's where our workers, our employees, uh, go to work every day. It's our location. Right. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. For Thank you. That's very interesting. Any other questions? Um, any state legislation that we ought to keep in mind or not really No, there is. The legislature has approved a $15 minimum wage that is also incremental, and we just don't know if the governor's going to sign it. Yeah, so that's been uh, through both sides of the House, or both sides of the legislature. And is on his desk for signature, along with a number of other uh, proposals, like a uh, four-year property tax freeze and, uh, and and other things, which I, I don't remember at the time. Um, and uh, it's a similar uh, it's a similar law, uh, but the the slope of the curve is lower. And by that I mean, on July 1st, under the county law. Um, uh, the uh, minimum wage is ten dollars. Um, on January first next year, January first of eighteen, under the state law, it's nine dollars. And and it's not clear to me what the increments going forward would, would be or what that timing would be. But it you know it, it terminates you know the this curve terminates in twenty twenty two, which is two years past the uh, you know so it might be like a January first thing. 
or, or, or something like that, and the math would work out. Yeah. And there's no opting out of the state law? No. So, um, so anyway, that's uh, that's wages. We're at uh, uh, fifty-six percent for uh, for wages, and again, the uh, comparable number there, according to the standard, it's a sixty percent. The uh, fringe benefits um, have uh, <coughs> have been between fifteen point three percent and nineteen percent over the past eight years, the same time period. And I want to point out that those percentages exclude the special payments that are being made to IMRF to uh, basically the fees are uh, liability to uh, IMRF, our uh, previously unfunded liability. So what that means is that in, um, in this current fiscal year, uh, as I was going through this analysis, I subtracted $2 million from, uh, from the payments that were made to IMRF to normalize IMRF to what you would pay on an ongoing basis. And for the budget year, I subtracted $500,000, which we put in the budget to defeat the balance of our liability to IMRF. Um, and uh, again, to normalize our, uh, uh, our uh, expenditure. Uh, the current balance uh, shows 19%. Uh, you know, again, you know, um, you know, this is a, a, as a result uh, to a great degree to, you know, health insurance uh, inflation. Uh, IMRF has increased the annual costs, but not significantly. Uh, and if you add the salaries plus the fringe benefits, we're, at, we're currently at 74% overall. Uh, and again, uh, that compares to the standards at 70% plus the plus the uh, range that we you know, that we found that was you know that ran up to seventy six percent for comparable libraries. And so it's it's, it's seventy four percent about the current current increases that are going to come or is that with the current increases? Uh, with the current increases. Okay, and just to remind everybody uh, when we drafted the budget, we drafted it with a three percent increase. Does anyone have any questions of uh, Brad Best on that discussion? Does anyone have any comments or questions in general? Uh, just one, one quick question. So, you know, I, I know that you guys, the library puts information out on the library site about salaries. And I, I'm just looking at it and I noticed there's, I think it's for 2009 through whatever, but it doesn't look like it yet. 2006, it's the, late, the latest one. Is it, is, are they going to put that out there on the library site, or is that something? Uh, we actually um, we actually put out the, uh, what the public law requires us to do as members of IMRF, which is um, which is uh, compensation packages greater than seventy five thousand dollars a year. Uh, so that's out there. Yeah, no, I saw I saw that. For the but we haven't up, we haven't updated the you know the the 2016, 2017 because the years are over. Okay. Yeah, because I, I when I was looking because I saw 2014 out there, 2015, and so I thought 2016 would be out. There. Is 2016 not okay. out there? Uh, no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Any questions or comments other than that? Yes. Neil, um, in the presentation said that we could possibly lower the budget piece because the village opted out, but I think we maybe keep it the same just in case the state legislator decision kind of opts us back in just to be safe in our budget line because it's right now it's still a variable that's unknown. So uh, Jerry, because it's in the budget doesn't mean we're right, it doesn't mean that we've just spent it. It's just you know, we don't right. know. Okay. Anyone else? Dan? Um, all right, um, so we have a motion on the table, and uh, if there are no further questions, I'm going to ask for a roll call then. Can I ask a question? What exactly are we voting for? Oh, I'm sorry, it was a while ago when I actually, I think I read the, 
uh, motion a little while ago. Well, we do have a move on to the second, don't we? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this is on page 55, and you can reread it there, and this is the motion to adopt the budget and the appropriations, which are set forth beginning on page 56 and go through page 50. So that sets forth again our budget and uh, the appropriations. And Kurt, did you want to, you know, sometimes before you, I think you uh, described our budget as uh, the budget is sort of a premise to the board as to, from the staff or from uh, the, uh, pr from the uh, executive director as to what, what's, what are you going to spend? What's the limit of what you're going to spend? And go ahead. Okay, Perhaps so you can state it better than I am right now. Okay, so what I've stated uh, previously is uh, that there's, there's basically uh, two promises that are contained in this document. Um, the budget, which is, if you're looking at, at the document, uh, the column on the right, is uh, the promise that, um, that the executive staff or the executive director makes to the board. Uh, so Susan Lucky is saying, I, I don't plan on spending any more than this. And, and the implication is, if, if she does materially, that she'll, you know, that she'll come to you and say, I really need to spend more because of these reasons. Okay? And, and then it's up to you to judge their legitimacy or not. The appropriation is the um, uh, promise of the board to the county, essentially because this document will be filed with the county. And, and what we're telling the county is that we do not plan to exceed the uh, appropriate amount, which by custom is double the budget. And uh, should we um, should we do that, uh, we plan to come to you and file the appropriate paperwork for notification that we are exceeding it. Okay. Um, so, to operate the library um, uh, in its operating account, total operating dollars are six million two eighty nine four forty six, and that's on page uh, fifty seven. That's about one third from the bottom. Okay, and then the balance of the accounts are um, uh, building and maintenance, basically building the site. Um, maintenance that, that we undertake every year. Uh, and uh, special reserve uh, funds that we plan to spend. And then um, followed by special uh, revenue funds that we plan, uh, that we plan to spend. Uh, and those are usually legislated to some degree. So, you know, in the audit fund, we're required to have an annual audit. Uh, you passed that last meeting. It was sixteen thousand four hundred. Uh, we're required to have liability insurance for twenty nine thousand eight sixty eight. We're required to pay our share of social security, um, Illinois unemployment taxes, workers' compensation insurance. You know, for a total of uh, three hundred forty three thousand dollars. And then the last bit of information has to do with the uh, supplemental grants, uh, which are which are comprised primarily uh, of the uh, per capita grant. So the total uh, is uh, 7 million four thirty-eight seven sixty-three um, that we plan to uh, spend in the upcoming year. The appropriations figure is one we never usually approach anywhere near it. It's really the, right. the levy that's the determining amount as to what we take in and right. the budget as to what we spend out right. for uh, uh, funds. Right. So, uh, are there any other questions? You know, I, I had a question. Um, well, actually, I have a request, but then I have a question. Um, Greg uh, provided us with a budget presentation at our meeting, and I would like to go on record requesting in the future, whenever there is a presentation, whether it's given by Greg or someone else, if it could be included in our packet so we can review it ahead of time, because I ended up having questions for him but um, didn't come prepared. I was really ready just to uh, address the um, actual budget. So I know the Village has a copy of all presentations with their board packets, and it's really helpful to get it in advance. 
Are you talking about like PowerPoint presentations? Yes. Okay. For example, like tonight I have two questions for him which I could have asked, but I was just so overwhelmed with my budget questions. So I do have a couple, I just didn't understand a couple things he mentioned in his PowerPoint and I would like to address that. Like sure, that. the PowerPoint you just, we just no, saw? No, PowerPoint from the budget. From the last meeting. The budget presentation that he gave. Um, um, April 26th, yes, it was um, about, you repeatedly mentioned um, a plus or minus 10% approach and the reasons why um, it would be problematic. And I didn't understand what your idea of a 10% plus or minus meant. You, you said something about um, we can decrease stuff by 10%. Sure, but it, if we decrease costs, by 10%, you would have to decrease services, probably decrease services by more than 10% because certain things, such as maintenance of the building, has to happen whether we do all services, whether we do all services or 10% or 50%. I didn't understand that connection with the 10% cut. So um, I have a presentation in front of me and I'll read it to you. Uh, the point that I made. Um, uh, I think it's the second slide, or the first, actually the first slide about the budget methodology, is that the library uses a, a service-driven model to build its budget. Services and physical layout drive the numbers and types of personnel needed on a day-to-day -day basis to live up to the library's mission. It's too dangerous to take uh, a plus 10% approach to budgeting, or for that matter, a minus 10% approach. Decreasing the budget significantly means that the library must decrease its services as well uh, as well to achieve such a cut. With such an approach, uh, with such an approach, we may miss something or ask for too much money. Software expenses, for example, are specifically attached to renewals of products important to our patrons and necessary for the operation of the library. And programming expenses are specifically attached to anticipated programs over the next uh, fiscal period. So the idea here is, is that uh, uh, what a lot of organizations, what some organizations do, is they say, give me last year plus 10% or 8% or 5% or some sort of standard percent uh -huh. percentage. Or some, they get new management and they say, we're going to do a 10% across the board decrease. And that's it. Everybody has to, everybody has to tie it to 10%. Well, you know, that, uh, that might work for some budget line items, but for some line items it won't work. Software expenses, as I mentioned, we have, um, we have a schedule of uh, software purchases. Some have a five-year horizon, some have a two-year horizon, some are annual. And uh, so for us to say plus or minus 10% on a line item like software will either be you know, increasing the line item, especially if it comes off of a high year, uh, and then going to a, a low expenditure year where we have more money than we know what to do with in that particular year. Or if you look at, you brought up maintenance, if you look well, at... Well, that was in, in your comments. If you, look, if you look at maintenance, the board has an obligation to maintain the building, to maintain the physical space, you know, the roof, the siding, etc. So if... If we tell uh, if we tell Dave Dabrowski, uh, you got to do with 10% less. Um, we may not caulk the windows, or we may not fix the soft spots in the roof that uh, that we fix every year to extend the life and, and so forth. As as we move through the year, which would compromise the the building overall. And as you know, as homeowners, you know the you know the more you put off something, you know water's very powerful and other things start to happen, mold grows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you start to compound things. We really try to take a bottom-up approach so that we're, when we ask for uh, a budget allocation, that's what we need in order to have a successful program, have a successful year, have a, you know, have a tight building. Okay, and then and the reason I'm confused is with like the past 15, 20 years with accounting and finance, what a 10% cut in the companies I've worked for, whether they were governmental or corporations, we are restricted to a 10% budget cut in our department. We don't expect to cut 10% off of our employees. What we do is every vendor that does work for us, we pass along a 10% decrease. 
And what I've learned with governmental agencies is everyone thinks you're a cash cop. So they expect to charge the highest and they expect to get paid. But I didn't see why that would be something you couldn't accomplish, especially with the years and years of, of vendor relations you have, just to help you, you know, decrease your spending. It, and 10% really is not that much. Yeah. So have we never fathomed that we could do that? No, we fathom it every day. We do. But it. we never do it? No, we do it. Uh, we do it. We. Uh, uh, we're constantly rebidding our, our service contracts, uh, constantly looking at uh, uh, the you know, service contracts for you know lawn and uh, uh, exterior maintenance. We're looking uh, looking at the overnight services that you know come in and clean. But shouldn't that be done right at the forefront when you determine your budget? You cut it ten percent. You work within that, and then it just happens. Because if we look at our you know we've ended not ten percent less. And if we look at this budget compared to last year's budget, it's a million dollars more. So there isn't really a 10% cut happening anywhere. Well, I, I disagree with that. I mean, I... I, I but yeah. the numbers don't lie. Where would we see that? Uh, you'd have to look at the contracts in particular. I, I will tell you that yeah, we've, we've taken some contractors and said, uh, okay, so this is your bid on, uh, on a monthly basis. What if we pay cash up front? And uh, we've, you know, we've been able to get four or five percent uh, by paying cash up front for some. Pay cash up front. Well, not dollar bills, but we pay, give them a check for a year, for a year in advance. And by that, in that manner, we're able to reap uh, four or five percent savings. So, if we're already and doing this, why can we not establish a budget that's ten percent less? Well, I guess first of all, I don't believe we we're given any directive to them to cut the budget by ten percent. But I'm just saying, why but we wouldn't? Know, but, I mean, you just made this up right on the spot here that they were supposed to cut the budget 10%. I, that was not a discussion that was happening. Oh, no, no, no. I, I asked for a definition, an explanation of his reason why we can't cut 10%. And he looks at it differently than I do. So that's why there's a difference. Well, I think, uh, I think we got an explanation as to why you can't, across the board, cut a budget by 10%. Why that just doesn't generally work. Uh, in no, general, no. because there are some items that you just can't cut by 10%. Even if you said we'll buy 10% fewer books, you can't say, okay, we're going to pay 10% less for heating this year because it's not something in your control. It's a fixed cost, and you don't have exactly. really the ability exactly. of cutting it by 10%. But so I think that's wise. where Greg was going with that explanation as to why mm -hmm. you generally, even if you wanted to, even if they were given a directive to cut the budget by 10%, which they weren't, why you can't always just cut a budget 10% across the board, even if that's something that uh, our staff was given a directive to do, which they were not. And they were not, and, and I'm aware of that. What I'm saying is it's not an impossibility to cut 10% except for fixed costs, exactly. I just didn't understand why he found that there would be issues with maintenance and so forth. Like I said, there's another way to look at it. So I just need a clarification with that. And before we vote on the budget, I just had a couple of questions because I take it that our budget is the same as it was the last time we met. Um, I guess you did address the fact that um, the mayor or the village opted out of the wage hike. So are we not taking that out of our budget? I think we, we were just talking about that. And yeah. I think uh, well, what I heard so far is that we probably should maintain the budget as is because we're keeping in mind the possible state increase in the minimum wage, which would not be exactly the same, but um, our budget will allow for that increase. Not that we have to give that increase, but our budget would allow for that increase. Um, that's yeah. what I heard thus far. If there's the anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, the way I'm understanding this, that unlike the county, if the state says, bam, this is what you have to do, we have to do it. Uh, yeah. So that's the difference. So we're concerned that our governor yeah. will agree to this phrase. Is that what you're saying? Who knows know. know. what they're doing? They haven't had a budget for two God blessed years. I don't know. I don't know exactly, but okay. So then um, I also had a, another question, and I'm sorry, but um, I, Greg, I noticed in all the explanation you mentioned, and I think I understand this. There's 33900 for prior year's raises, which have to do with new hires. So 
Is, is our 3% raise, the amount you gave us, 48000 is that only calendar year, or is that the fiscal year? Uh, give me a reference. Were you looking at Um, I was um, actually, it was in the budget. We were talking about, like, our 3% raise is $48,000. I guess you were telling us about um, salaries and what the increases were. But then you said, and there's also 33900 for prior year's raises, new hire raises. So that made me think then, is 48000 only through December? Oh, okay. okay. No. What, uh, so um, uh, what some organizations do is they, um, is they have everybody that's, let's say, reviewed uh, or raised on January 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's assume that they have a calendar year fiscal. Okay, you would see that you would see that three percent, um, or at, at year end mm -hmm. in total. But we don't have that. Okay, we have some people who are raised, uh, raised like uh, last meeting you reviewed and awarded the raise to our director. Uh, by the same token, you have some people who will be reviewed and raised July fifteenth. Okay. early in, in the fiscal year. So, if you look at the impact of what a 3% raise is, is over what we've raised so far in the previous year, it's about $48,000 impact in the year. Okay. The thing you have to consider is that you don't just raise them for the year, that raise continues into the next year. Which is part of the budget. Yeah. Year. That's right. Okay, so that's I, I just I kind of thought that's what it meant, but I wasn't sure. Okay, um, and then um, I guess my question is: there is nowhere we could cut anything in this budget. We just think we need every penny. Uh, we we don't pad as a practice. I know we don't pad, but um, we're talking about eighty nine thousand dollars for new hires. I, I can't even fathom who we need to hire. I mean, I, I didn't see any explanation for that. Is that just something we threw out there? I mean, what are the plans for that? Is that one person? Well, exactly. Exactly. That was two part-time uh, IT assistants because we're reconfiguring the way we do the IT so that the IT workers focus primarily on the network. In the past, the IT department handled everything in the building that plugged in. So they were constantly being pulled away to handle lower, lower level tasks, and they were not able to spend their time on all of the work that they had the expertise for and all the training for. So we have made that department smaller, but kept its focus very strictly on, on network things, and we have moved a lot of that activity to the digital services department, but not all the librarian staff has the kind of skills that they need to do all the troubleshooting that they will be doing in the building, so we budgeted for two part-time Digital services IT assistance. That is so. That's and then I believe we are ahead. Did you did you intentionally? We have but, and we did also raise a part timer to full time. We have not officially done that, but that is in the budget to raise a particularly say, strong. Were you also in that considering? Uh, Passport, if you needed potential to have somebody else for a passport as part time. We did not budget for that. We are hoping okay. to be able to do it on our existing staff. Okay. Um, okay. And we may have to move people around a little bit and, you know, tweak. Yeah, very much so. Okay. And then I have one more question, and this is for Susan. I did look up Harwood Institute on the yes. internet. And I learned that, and Howard Institute is the organization that you're going to um, enlist to communicate, to teach our staff how to communicate in the community. Well, I noticed it's part of ALA, and um, it says that ALA sponsors them. It's not part of ALA, but they do work with ALA. Okay, so the, the website I went on said 2017 Harwood Heights slash ALA. And I guess there's a fall session coming up and a summer session? Right. Well, they do virtual sessions, so I was not going to be sending people around the country to okay. do this. I was going to be having people do it electronically. Okay. And what I wanted to share with you is I think the purpose
purpose of this is to get our staff to um, learn how to um, interact with multicultural um, communities, with our community, which is who we are. Uh, that's like racial equity and all of that. Um, I'm a little concerned that we're jumping to an organization affiliated with ALA, and actually, according to them, the first person, I think, cost $14.65, and everyone after that is $900 and something. And I know you mentioned that you wanted critical mass, you wanted everybody to be trained. The only thing I would like to offer about this is there are incredible organizations just within our area who have already dealt with um, the problems that arise trying to interact with different races or, or um, religions and, and different um, ethnicities. And I don't think you'd spend half as much, and they may be people you already know. I'd like you to at least give that a shot. I've spent six years in racial equity training. I've been all over the country, and there are some incredible places right here, even in Skokie, that could probably do an incredible job with our staff who's already trained staff in Skokie who has right. an even more multicultural area. Right. No, I, I, uh, I'm not married to that. I don't think that's... So before you sure jump on it, I'd exactly. love to just share the, no, I think this that's information with you because I think it would be beneficial and yeah. it would... And you know what helps too? Something like this is really a delicate topic. You don't just send everybody there. It's not right. really... You know, part of it isn't really that we don't know, it's that we come from where we come from, and, and it takes time to process and learn and change. Exactly. So you may not need to send everybody. Or, oh, I, I you know. didn't intend to send everybody, but I thought we could start training a few. But again, I was going to do the virtual version, which is much less expensive than that. Okay. But before you do, let me just share my contact, yeah, because I think you know her. Okay. Yeah, I would love to. I can't think of her name right now. I'm sure you can email that after the meeting. All right, unless there's uh, any further questions, um, I'd like a roll call then. Karen? Yes? Carolyn? We're voting on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. <coughs> I'm going to go no, uh, purely because, based off of uh, my knowledge of, of the way I see things, and, and, and I hate to, I don't want to be the bad guy in the room, uh, but I, I still think. Uh, Working within the corporate world for 35 plus years, I, I, I see an entirely different way of, of approaching things. Now, I got a, I got a flawed Susan at our last meeting. She said, don't give me my entire raise. I was like stunned. You know, I, I, you know she came right out and said, don't, don't give me the highest point. But uh, I think that... Uh, I think she's doing a great job. I think that the people here come to the library to do a great job. And I don't think anybody comes in and says, well, what can I do to screw up today? <laughs> so it's just that I think that, you know, as I campaign uh, out there, I said, well, I wanted to get the biggest bang for our buck for the library pa patrons. And, uh, and I wanted to keep down the taxes. And. Uh, and I, I think that there's there's some opportunity there. Now again, not the expert. Two two meetings in, a couple handfuls of meetings before that. Uh, bear with me. Uh, you know, uh, it's just that when I when I see budgets and I manage projects in in, in the corporate world, it's it, it, it's it's brutal out there. It is it is tough. So. Uh, you know, uh, I just think that there, there might be some opportunities where we can get some productivity gains out of some other things, to shift some some monies for those really key things that, that the patrons want to do, the library wants. So, uh, don't hate me. Uh, but, uh, we don't hate you, you just have to vote. It's a no, but both okay. the next one yeah, Next item under new business 
and do a motion um, to approve that the Niles Public Library continue to participate in the non-resident library card Illinois program and charge an annual fee of $261 based on the formula established by the Illinois State Library. Do I have a motion to that back? Patty? Okay, I know. I'm not supposed to discuss or ask questions until after the motion. I have a motion. Second. Okay. okay. All right, fine. What's your question? My question is, is this pertaining to, say, people who are in non-library um, districts? Yes, these are the people in the unserved, unserved areas that have, okay. are not paying taxes to anyone, so this is basically the equivalent of the taxes they okay. would have. I am somewhat familiar because at school we have some kids that are all in this, and they're uh, under their uh, low income, so we pay it for them yeah. through the school. Okay. Thank you. Any further explanation that you'd like to make about that? Well, I, um, or? I just want to make it clear that, you know, the, it's ideally every person in the state of Illinois would have a library that was their home library that they were paying taxes to and they were able to use, but that is not the case. There are uh, millions of people that don't have it, and we have some areas very nearby us that do not have any library that serves them. They are in unincorporated Glenview. There's a little pocket of unincorporated Glenview and unincorporated um, this plane. So all of the rest of Maine Township is part of our library district, but there are pockets that don't have a library and do not pay taxes to anyone. Um, so there is the non-resident library card program in Illinois where they can buy, basically, a library card for the amount of money that they would have been paying in taxes. Um, and so it is, uh, and you just have to set the fee every year. So in the fee is based on the um, amount of money that we got from our tax sources, divided by our population, and uh, multiplied by the average number of people per household, which most recently was calculated at 2.5. So the exact number is $260.66 per household. Oh, it's per household. This is per household. This is not per person. Oh. Yeah, because then that, that's how your taxes work, too. You don't pay taxes yeah. per person, you pay taxes per household. Okay. All right. So, so what would be their benefit to paying an annual fee? Well, right now they can't check any, out from anywhere. They, um, but they could use other services. They can use our programs. Well, for example, our programs we um, offer first to our Niles residents. We usually hold five or six days for them to be able to register, and then we open it up to other people. Um, there is a collection, the Hot Picks collection, that are the newest and most popular items that can only be checked out by Niles card holders. Um, and then, yeah, they, they're not allowed to, they can't check out any electronic materials or use any of our databases. So they can use them inside the library building, but they can't use them in their home. And if they have a Niles card, they can go to any... Library in general, yeah. we all reciprocate right. with each other. So yeah, so that you, would be you the. You can't go to any library. You can't and check anything out unless mm -hmm. you have a card. Correct. Mm -hmm. right, so. Do they do the same thing for Chicago as well? Chicago residents pay to the Chicago Public Library. Okay. They, well, they they pay to the city for the Chicago Public Library. Yeah, yeah our district residents pay to us. So, uh, say, a Morton Grove person can use their Morton Grove card here. They would register their card in our database. Our people can go to Morton Grove and use their library. And there's a great deal of that back and forth traffic. We also share our collections um, where you can put things on hold. Other other libraries. Libraries. But without that library card, you can't do any of that. Yeah. I have a Chicago library card. Use their facilities. But um, I have to say, we hardly get any people that do this. I mean, very few people actually. No, that's so like but this is just if you can get a Chicago, Chicago library card, you have to be a resident there? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. work for a company sometimes. Right, no, businesses can get a business card, uh -huh. so it, that way it could be yeah. that way. Just well. like, because I work in this place, I get some privileges at the Displains library. Got it. Okay. Cool. Right, unless there's any other questions, ask for a roll call. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dennis? Yep. Diane? Yes. 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 Okay. Moving to our next item under new business, this is 8C. Do I have a motion to approve the recommended remove, renewal of the short-term disability and long-term disability plans through principal insurance 
and discontinue the life insurance and accidental death and dismemberment insurance <clears throat> beginning August 1st, 2017 uh, and ending on June 30th, 2018. Do I have a motion? Yes. Second? Okay. I have a question, first of all. Why, why the date, August 1st, instead of July 1st? So, uh, the uh, library adapted uh, IMRF beginning on August 1st, last year. And uh, on August 1st, uh, we started contributing uh, to, the, uh, to the pension portion of it and also to the uh, insurance portion of it. They have life insurance and temporary disability uh, along with permanent disability. They don't have any accidental death and dismemberment. Um, the, uh, the insurance portion of the IMRF uh, relationship is not available to our employees until they've had 12 months of um, uh, employment in an IMRF uh, facility under an IMRF plan. So uh, employees that have never uh, worked anywhere but um, uh, Niles Public just uh, public library district did not have this coverage under IMRF, so we continued our coverage with our uh, provider principal life insurance. Now, uh, now we're at the end of the year, so everybody has 11 months at least. You know, so there are some people that have more than that, but everybody has 11 months at least, and the insurance benefits won't kick in for employees who have 11 months until they've completed 12 months, which would be at 731. So therefore, on August 1st, they'll be in the IMRF plan, and they'll, they'll be covered by IMRF. The short-term, and let's take the disability first. Uh, the short-term and long-term disability plan that we offer currently pays 60% of your, uh, your wage up to a maximum of $1,000 a week after a seven-day waiting period. And that goes on for six months. The long-term disability that, that principal offers uh, kicks in after six months and is 60% up to $3,000 a month. And um, uh, so uh, when we look at IMRF, IMRF has a couple of issues. One issue is their definition of disability is very narrow. Okay. So essentially what they say is the employee cannot perform any tasks uh, assigned by the employer. So if you're in charge of sweeping the floors and you hurt your back, hurt a leg or something, can no longer sweep, sweep the floors, that's fine, sit at the desk and do this alternative. You know, type of thing. Um, and if, if there is nothing like that, then you're eligible for temporary disability. Um, the uh, principal product, by comparison, has a, more, uh, has a broader definition. Uh, the employee cannot perform the majority of tasks related to his or her job description. So if your job is sweeping the floor and you can no longer sweep the floor, you're disabled. Okay. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the way that IMRF works is that there is uh, only temporary and permanent disability. Permanent disability is if you can't do anything for anybody, for any employer, forever, then you're permanently disabled and that insurance kicks in. So there is no long-term disability. Also, uh, on their temporary disability, you're limited to 30 months of coverage, uh, which is calculated by taking your total IMRF experience and cutting it in half. So somebody who's just getting 12 months on August 1st would get six months of disability, basically. Um, and that's it. You're done. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the IMRF benefit, uh, is equal to 50% of wages, and that's up to their uh, that's up to their uh, statutory limit, which I think is 118,500. Uh, so about 59,000 dollars. 
um, annually, uh, which is five thousand dollars a month, and I think uh, uh, twelve fifty a week if I if I did the math correctly. Um, but you know, if you look at if you look at the sixty percent that principal offers, um, that covers you know that covers about ninety percent of our employees pretty uh, you know pretty thoroughly. So the idea here is to supplement the uh, long-term and short-term disability, or I should say the permanent and temporary disability plan in the IMRF with this principal product. Okay. Um, in terms of life insurance, if I could, uh, unless anybody has questions about disability. Can I, can I ask a question? Regarding IMRF, um, you said temporary disability would only be 30 months. Up to 30 months. Up to 30 months, and they would get $59,000 a year. So what would happen to a person in that position? They would, if they would not be able to come back to work after 30 months, it's almost three years. Well, uh, so uh, the 59000 it's up to 59000 It's 50% of their wages. Oh, up well, to oh, okay. okay, so if somebody is earning 30000 a year, they would only get 15000 uh, a right. year, okay? Uh, after uh, after three years, after 30 months, months. they're done. And uh, then, what happened? No, seriously, like today, where would you go? So security? Probably. Yeah, probably and seriously. that's what happens. But what you're saying is that we would have someone on temporary disability for more than three years? We would have, what, what we have is a short-term disability, <coughs> which covers the first six months after a seven-day waiting period. And then after six months, long-term disability kicks in. So this, this component of IMRF, which we thought was advantageous, isn't, is what you're saying? Uh, there's value to it, but it's, it's, not, as, it's not as valuable as uh, we'd like it to be. All right, and then just one last question. They won't let you work at all, so if you get injured, you just have to stay home. Is that what they think? And then they're paying your salary, not you, not the library. Right, well, it's an insurance contract, right? And that's up to 30 months? Yes. But it, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're paralyzed from the neck down and you can't do any work whatsoever, then you can go into permanent disability. Right, but you mentioned how they can't do anything, which I, I understand. Could cost. I'm just trying to figure out now, now or even this doesn't work with IMRF. So, um, but go ahead, answer. You. Go ahead, you can continue. Okay. So regarding life insurance, uh, which is the other component of our contract, the relationship with principal, uh, IMRF offers. Um, 100% uh, of your annual wage up to the statutory limit of $118,500 with no accidental death or dismemberment after an employee has been an IMRF employee for 12 months. Uh, under 12 months, if you, you get 100% you get of your salary if you die on the job and if you if you don't die on the job, you get your contributions back. You get your four and a half percent back. So um, since you know since they do have you know since they do have a um, uh, a life insurance uh, a contract that doesn't have accidental death and death and dismemberment, um, you know we thought that you know it would uh, one times. One times your uh, annual salary would be uh, uh, good enough on a temporary basis. We could also consider offering um, a separate life insurance contract, which would be a, a group plan that um, individuals would fund out of their own pocket, and they could buy generally up to three hundred thousand dollars of life insurance if they feel that they need the coverage. Um, you yeah, know, but. I'm here to tell you, I don't know anybody that's ever collected on a life insurance policy because I don't know many people that have died. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, what, what our recommendation is is that we is that we uh, eliminate the uh, life insurance and the accidental death and dismemberment. Um, we go with the uh, short term and long term disability contract, which which would be. Um, which would uh, uh, take into consideration the, anything that they get from IMRF. So the benefit from principal would be reduced. It's an all sources contract. 
Uh, in addition, uh, we would change the uh, uh, contract to read that the uh, employees would be required to use their sick time and exhaust their sick time before collecting from the, uh, from the disability uh, insurer. And with all of those changes, uh, it works out to about $11,600 a year. Uh, previously, we've spent between $18,000 and $20,000 for this. Uh, the downside, any downside for the, the actual employees? Uh, yeah, if they uh, uh, die in their first 12 months at home. No, let's not do that. <laughs> Wait, I thought this would pick them up for the first 12 months. Uh, for disability. Ah, okay. Okay. All right, gotcha. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you bring up a good point. Any employee that we hire today mm -hmm. has to wait 12 months for disability. Mm -hmm. And I think disability, you know, somebody injuring a leg or an arm or, or something like that, uh, where they would uh, probably be on disability is, you know, has a greater chance than, you know, than uh, anything else. Yeah. Okay. So the insurance would be kept at one hundred eighteen thousand. That's the maximum. The life insurance. Uh, yes. That, okay. Yeah. And there is no accident. One time. One time. Disability. One time wage up to one hundred eight. Okay. No A, no A, B, and D. A, B, and D. If you died accidentally, it would double the benefit. Or if you lost, um, if you lost a, a leg or a foot or an arm or a hand or something like that, you know, they would reimburse you for that. I don't know what that. What their reimbursement schedule looks like. Hmm. So there, there is no ADD. Is that what you're? Saying? That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Do we have other questions? All right. If there are no questions, I guess I'll ask for a roll call. Kate Karen. Uh, yes. Carolyn. Um. Yes. Dennis. Yep. Daniel. Yes. Danny. Yes. Linda. Yes. Tim. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's move to our next item under unfinished business. Um, we have a motion to approve the recommended changes to administrative policy 3.02 of the library rules. Accept a motion. Uh, uh, Susan, can, I'm sorry, Susan, can you tell us a little bit? Oh, sure. sure. Um, if you recall, the library's current rules policy is, is for two pages. It's very broad. It basically just says if you create a disturbance, you know, you can't create a disturbance in the library. It doesn't spell out very much. So then I asked, um, and then there had been the question about the rule concerning doing business, conducting business in the library, mm -hmm. which we've talked about, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, we realize that a great many of the people that are in the library are using the library to conduct business. They're sitting at their laptop in the carol quietly working on their business right now, and technically under our rules, that would not be allowed. And uh, there are many meetings that take place here in our study rooms, and there's a lot of business being conducted. So that was the starting point for turning to our attorney. He then did a revision on it that was six pages and extremely detailed and so I brought that to you last month and basically asked for your guidance about do you want something in this level of detail or do you want something you know that really spells things out or do you want something a little tighter and you asked me to just come back with what I wanted to advocate for. So this is a set of rules that I think are workable. It, it take, took out some of the ones that he had that were things like, you know, he had a lot of language that is, is prohibited. Moving furniture is prohibited. You know, all kinds of things. Gambling in the library is prohibited. And, um, uh, oh, I apologize, yes. 79. Um, and so this, um, I think, gives enough specifics. And I would give you the example on point number two. Um, it spells out some of the behaviors where there are some people that use the library that are perhaps mentally ill or you know, don't know how to behave appropriately. And so if you just say you can't create a disturbance, that's not a good enough explanation for them. So it spells out some of the things like you cannot stare, you can't lurk, you can't touch. 
Um, it spells out some of those things, so you have a rule that you can point to saying, you know, you are not, not allowed to do that under the rules. So um, basically, my assistant director, Cindy, and I each independently reviewed these rules, edited them, and when we compared notes, we found that we were almost perfectly in sync. So to me, that says this is kind of the lean, mean version of these rules. Spell it gives enough detail. Does not spell out, you know, how you have to treat a miniature horse that comes to the library as a service animal, for example. Uh, I feel is too much detail in a policy. Um, uh, some of the material having to do with candidates for office was part of the original policy, and Ed Dennis did make sure that these were completely legal so that free speech rights were being maintained while still provide, you know, not interfering with the rights of patrons to be using the library. So I think that this is a good, strong policy. Um, the part about business, is specifically, it removes the line about conducting business in the library, but it does say, where can I look at Point number 21 is, now, is, is to do with business. Selling products or services and soliciting donations are prohibited on library property, except when approved by the library director, which gives us a loophole if uh, Girl Scout cookies, for example. If that's what the board, you know, if the board is okay with that, then I would approve things like that. But in general, people can't be selling things in the library if you can't sell a whole jewelry stand at a carol or something like that. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Um, I, I have a question or two. Um, but, but anyone else want to go first? Uh, I have a question at number six. Okay. Um, I thought we had, it seems like there should be wording of something except when allowed for specific programs or such. Don't, I mean, we okay. had That's presentations where they bring birds and, yep. you know, alligators. Yeah, alligators. <laughs> Snakes. Okay. Wars. Or like you have the library thing where the kids reach a dog. Yeah, have that too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good addition. With that. Um, number twenty-two. Back to the candidates. Um, so I know that probably the library, like many other sort of semi-private places, will have candidates collecting signatures by yes. it, or may have people who want to do that. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how this rule would be interpreted. I mean, it sounds like you know, the library is not intended to be used for building support for candidates for public offices or other ballot measures. So does that mean, would you interpret that, that people cannot collect signatures inside the library? Correct. What about outside the library? Outside the library, they can as long as they're not blocking the entrance. And, and we had that come up last year and had to uh, contact Dennis to get a clarification mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, and uh, you know, when I raised the question with Dennis, can we ask him to, if they want to step into the vestibule if it's a horrible day, and he said absolutely not. But once you've opened the door, you've opened the door. Mm -hmm. okay. Dennis, uh, Dennis the, Walsh is our attorney for Client Thorpe and Jenkins. Yeah, I need that, but I just wanted to I sure. follow Dennis, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify for the record. Correct, <laughs> yes. So we said uh, Dennis, Dennis. Yes. No. No. So another question I have is, um, Certainly people who are doing business in terms of working in their laptops are not bothering anyone else and not using up resources. One thing I do have a concern about is if people are reserving rooms to conduct business. Um, I noticed, I, I think you mentioned it one other time, some attorneys were doing depositions in our rooms, which really sort of surprised me. Uh, what I, I'm concerned about is if people are conducting business in and reserving rooms so that our other patrons aren't able to get rooms whenever, whenever they want them. You know, if people are doing business and making money, and whereas a book club can't meet because these rooms are being used, I'm concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's um, a fair concern, but generally we wouldn't know about that. Diane is occasionally contacted by a lawyer who has a client who is a Niles cardholder, and they are reserving that room on behalf of the cardholder. I don't know how otherwise we would know sort the sorts There's of things. There's going to be a court reporter sitting there typing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we don't. Reservation. Yeah, we don't. We don't no, know. No, we know from the reservations. It's yeah. true. But I mean, I mean, you can sort of tell when someone's conducting that type of business. Right. You're walking I, yeah. around the library. I, yeah. I, I mean, there are 
many business meetings that take place here, uh, people meeting with clients all the time. And they will quite often reserve one of the study rooms to do that, but um, I think I, my understanding was that was part of what they were intended for. I mean, the mayor has come over here with some of his people to conduct business over here and get have things notarized and, you know, we uh, have rooms being used for all kinds of purposes. And so, to me, if they're not creating a disturbance, I, we have not restricted it. I don't know how to restrict it without asking a lot of information about the intended use of the room. Mm -hmm. um, and again, my, my questions go mostly to reserved rooms because Correct. that's prohibiting someone else from using that yes. space. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, someone who's making money could afford to rent a room someplace or to rent space. And um, whereas not-for-profits or book clubs, things like that, can't always do that. So that's a concern that I have. Do we do we find that our rooms are sometimes all booked up? Our study rooms are sometimes, but um, yeah, but a book group would typically be booking this room. And in that uh, deposition, that's not the kind of room they're booking. They would just be booking a small study room. Um, and you know that's a kind of a time of day sort of thing. I don't. I, they, they definitely the law firms are paying a fee. They do pay to use the room. Oh, they do. Yeah, any profit organization is paying a fee. Oh, okay. Well, how do we know if they're for profit or not? For They'll have book to her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. I. I. I uh, they provide them with a copy of the policy, and a lot of times after they read the policy, they don't come back okay. and uh, reserve the vote. I mean, the one thing where I could see where it could become a problem potentially is if we started being very heavily used by tutors. And that has been a problem for some other libraries. It has not been for us. Mm -hmm. So if that became a problem, I think I would have to come back and talk with you all about it. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so when the rooms are reserved, do you ask them? What? I, no, it's in two different circumstances. Sometimes it'll be a person like an organization wanting to book a meeting room, and they will be calling Diane, and Diane does ask a lot of questions because the meeting rooms are guided by policy, and the, the groups have to follow that policy. The study rooms, generally, they are just going to the digital services desk, or and they're giving their library card, and they're saying, I want a room, and they're booking with their library card. Now, my question is, you brought up the, the idea of tutoring. If a cardholder says, I need this room, and uh, they bring a tutor in, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really more, I think some libraries have had a problem with tutors setting up shop in the library mm -hmm. and hogging the resources. Okay. And so that has not been a problem here. It's occasional that somebody is doing that, but it's... Because I know of a uh, family that insists that their tutor leads them here. Right, because we're neutral ground, and I think yeah. that's very appropriate in a lot of cases. Yeah. Is, is that's why somebody meeting yes. with your, a stranger meeting with your child to be in a public space, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you say you charge a fee, that's for the meeting rooms, the but meeting not rooms. the study rooms. Correct. What is the meeting right. rooms up here now? It's quite a five dollars or fifty for the well, the lecture meeting room is fifty dollars for a two hour, mm -hmm. and then the board room and the lower level meeting room are twenty five dollars. See, like a condo association is holding a meeting, they are not charged. But if a management company calls and schedules a condo meeting, then we charge them because the condo association is actually paying the management company to run the meetings. Mm -hmm. And I have to approve all of those requests. Yeah. Nothing goes on the calendar before Susan approves it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, anyone else? Yes. Just one last question. I, sure. I, I, as I looked through this, I didn't see anything in regards to uh, age of a child being dropped off. Oh, that's a great question. We have a separate policy for that. So, um, yeah, that's not specifically covered here. It, but we do have, that's got, yeah, there are things like a non-smoking policy and an okay. unattended child. There are many other policies that we have. Good. These are more just like the rules. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Probably right. understand. I thought it was um, interesting that chewing tobacco was on there. Oh, how are you? Yeah, I know, but how would you? Well, there's a spitter. Into a spitter? Oh, okay. All right. You ever saw someone chew tobacco? There's no bathing in the sink. Okay. All right. I know. Believe me, yeah. <laughs>
My grandfather used to chew. Right? He saw it, he right. know it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Nice. All right. Um, Can I just, um, I just had one concern. Um, I, I'm a little leery about not adopting the attorney's recommendations. Um, I can't say I've read them all, but Susan, for example, you mentioned, you know, so somebody wants to move the chair. If they get hurt, you know, there we are liable for a lawsuit. And, you know, there are so many things going on today. Believe it or not, an attorney is well aware of these things that seem like overdone, but they are actually happening. And I think if we don't have them in writing, you're going to just have to deal with issues that you can't justify a decision. So I'm wondering, do we care if it's three pages longer and not miss what the attorneys already included there? Well, you haven't. It's, that example in particular is a good example where some libraries have very strict rules for their patron conduct. Um, and then other libraries have a looser culture. We we have a looser culture It's here. not about a loose culture. It's about being liable to a lawsuit. Well, I, I do take your point, but people are moving our furniture all the time. It's just the way people are these days. You know, nobody, really? oh, mm -hmm. all the time, they pe make they themselves completely comfortable in whatever space they are. And so, you know, I do have a couple of staff members that are like, don't move that chair. And then, <laughs> you know, like you move a chair from one table to another table and they're like in big trouble. But I don't think that's an appropriate rule in this day and age when people are so used to kind of the more fast casual kind of mentality where you kind of can make yourself a little bit comfortable. So I don't think that any of the rules that we removed endanger anyone. I do take your point about okay. him having suggested them all, but most of what we took out was just a whole lot of detail. And it was very much a cut and pasted document. Clearly, it had three or four people had pulled in hunks of other documents into nice. it, and there was a lot of repetition as well. Okay. So, I mean, I do take your point that he is our lawyer, and this is what he sent, but it just didn't seem very workable to me. Okay. But that was why I wanted to ask last month. All right. Uh, unless there's other questions, uh, maybe we'll call. Okay. Uh, Karen. Yes. Carolyn. Uh, yes. Dennis. Yes. Dennis. Yes. Patty. Yes. yes. Linda. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, the next item on our agenda is, uh, under unfinished business, is discussion of board committees. Um, given the hour and the time, I'm, I'm not really planning uh, on appointing any committees right now, but I just opened this up to discussion briefly as to whether or not you think we even need committees at this point, or um, if it's a, you know, it, it, the reason I ask is that it, it, it's, uh, sometimes I think my opinion that if you have a special project going on, sometimes it's helpful to have a committee, like uh -huh. construction or revamping personnel rules or things like that. Uh -huh. But in addition to that, it has to be a situation where some people are really interested in a particular topic and want to go to a lot of meetings, and the rest of the board will rely on their recommendation. And the rest of the board doesn't want to hear all the same presentations at a separate meeting again that the subcommittee already heard. So, just keeping that in mind, um, if anybody wants to throw anything out about uh, committees, you're welcome to do that now, or you can contact me later if you have any thoughts about even the, the need for any committees at all uh, at this point in time. We can always do committees as a whole if we have something in particular we want to address at a separate meeting, other than our board meeting, um, but I just throw that out there. Do we have anything pressing at that are coming up that you could foresee where we would need a committee at the moment? No, um, I think, uh, I, I, I think, I can't offhand think of anything, no. Can you yeah. tell me what kind of committees? Well, we yes, have we have, we have, we've had building and grounds, for instance. Technology was another one. Personnel was one. Um, Finance. Hmm? Finance. Yeah. Now, were these committees created for a specific reason, or did they always exist and they met to discuss just general matters? They, they haven't always consistently existed. Some committees have sort of existed for a while, and then been well, dormant. Well, five years, years. What committees have we had? Buildings oh. and grounds. Buildings right. and grounds. We were doing all the construction. Over the past two years, I've known buildings and grounds because of Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, and well, that was the signage. 
there was a side motion. Okay, but so we don't have a committee meeting to engage the residents. I thought that was the purpose of these meetings. We had a technology committee mm -hmm. and we disbanded it. Um, I remember Susan wanted to give Tim and I some details and it was supposed to include the uh, residents and staff and then it never materialized. So how are these committees decided upon? I mean, what happened to that? It's, it's, um, it's the board's president's discretion on which committees they want to form. So every time a new board president is elected, it really is up to them. Um, but what, what would have been that committee's purpose? Well, that committee about this. At the time, I had suggested to Linda that there were two different possible technology committees. One would be just a, like a two-person member board member committee to review any major purchases that were coming up, and that's what we ended up doing, and we did meet with you and them. The other possibility is a much grander scale one in, with community involvement that I still want to do someday, but that takes a lot of careful planning because you don't want to waste anybody's time. Mm -hmm. You want to really know what you're trying to work toward in that. So I actually still am very interested in doing that, but it was something I had learned about in my technology course work that I did for the administration certification. And uh, we, did, we ended up doing a smaller scale technology committee. There would be no need to just have general committees and have staff and board and residents part of it for the library. Is this, is, is this not done in a library setting? Generally. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out yeah. how we. I'm just talking about subcommittees right now, subcommittees of the board. Um, well, I'm not sure what one means over the other, so that's why I brought it up. No, don't. A subcommittee okay. would be usually three members of the board. That's what a subcommittee usually has. And the purpose is for something specific? Mm -hmm. Generally, yes. Mm -hmm. Generally, yeah. Okay, and unless there's any other business, um, we're at the end of our agenda, and I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion. Second. Yes, ma'am.